Welcome back to Progressive Talk with Dave and Josh. This is number 19 podcast. Welcome back, Dave. Hey there, Josh. We got quite a smorgasbord of discussion before us, talking about the impeachment, Bernie, the upcoming debate, campaign numbers. Stay with us. Let's start right in. So the big news, of course, is this Ukraine scandal. What are your thoughts, Dave? Good and bad, ugly? Let's start with Trump, and then we'll go to Joe Biden. Okay. So is it good for Trump? Yes. Uh, he wins these battles all the time. Uh, the political battle, the PR battle, it's going to be great for Donald Trump. This is what he lives for. This is what he wants. This is where this is where Donald Trump shines. Uh, so I, I worry about that. But on the other front, you know, uh, legally, politically, we still have to do this, too. We still have to do the impeachment thing. We still have to go that route. Uh, the Constitution says we should. Uh, we should. So, uh, but like I said, I think Donald Trump is good at winning these types of battles. And he usually he usually wins them. But I don't know. Can he win a constitutional battle? Likely not. He's kind of a brazen, blatant criminal, uh, you know, and yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's going to be just buckle your seatbelt because this is going to get really intense. It already has gotten intense. His Twitter is off the charts. He did 100 tweets in 36 hours. This guy is just going to implode. But it'll work for him. I don't know. Um, as far as Joe Biden, mm, let's talk about Joe Biden here for a second. Uh, I think it is initially it's bad for him. I, I think he's going to, uh, you know, be exposed to. He, I mean, his corruption is going to get exposed and dug up, and you know, his sins will be uncovered. His crony capitalism uh, and his crony capitalist son is going to be dug up and drug out there. But I really think the establishment may go to bat for him and it will actually turn out good for joe biden because everyone will come to his rescue uh the establishment sticks together uh, the pelosi wing of the party will be like okay we got to go to bat for joe biden now it's going to be like a big campaign boost and you know i think joe can really benefit from this too just because there's going to be a rallying cry in the establishment to go for the guy who's polling number one and that's Joe Biden. What do you think? Yeah, this is a very complex one, isn't it? Very. I do agree with you. Donald Trump is all about chaos, and he thrives in that type of environment. He knows media. He knows how to create a framework, a narrative that's winning for him. He knows how to play victim. Nancy Pelosi led this particular impeachment inquiry at week optics of it don't frame well you know it just doesn't come across strong enough what i think it's going to do i think it's going to mobilize people on both fronts what's going to be most injured out of this whole discussion initially i thought maybe not but now i'm sort of changing my mind on this we'll be talking about real issues that american people are concerned about care about and certainly this is Donald Trump potentially breaking the law, you know, violating the United States Constitution, betraying the American people, get all that. Right. Um, but there's a bigger picture than simply, uh, you know, uh, bringing out the legal case against Donald Trump. Uh, there's a case about this is a turning point in American history. This is a very vital moment. And do we want to be on that debate stage, especially since we now have Tom Steyer that has made the debate stage present, how much of that's going to be consumed with discussion about the impeachment? And mm -hmm. as you said, the corporate media framing things in such a way that you're either on Biden's side or you're not on Biden's side. And that's sort right. of the momentum that gets caught up, the snowball effect. This would become very essentially uh, down to the very detail, a uh, make or break. Joe Biden the mainstream media has got to make up their mind, and I'm not sure all of these different networks agree on who is their coordinated pick. 
Uh, I don't know if they have decided to give up on Joe Biden or they've decided to switch over to Elizabeth Warren. Maybe there's a little bit of inside argument going on. But uh, yeah, this is what I'm seeing coming up for this debate. Uh, but uh, just to wrap it up, because I'm making this a bit long, my point in all this is I think it's going to be a washout. I think what you're going to find, you're going to get a lot of Trump supporters and even those that sympathize with Trump as a victim. But you're also mm-hmm. going to get just as many people who maybe weren't paying attention to politics and Tom Steyer's on the stage, impeachment becomes a big thing, Biden and Warren who will very clearly come out against you know, Trump. So it's going to be a rallying cry coming from both sides, basically is what I'm saying. So what do you think about the case I've just made and how that's all going to go down? Uh, just kind of hone in on the primary and how, how the centrists are going to be bolstered by the impeachment uh, more than the progressives. The progressives want to stay on message when it comes to kitchen table policies uh, like Medicare for all, like Green New Deal, like Fight for 15, like UBI. Uh, and the centrists... You know, they're not really strong in this territory. They like to have the flowery rhetoric, uh, the platitudes, the cliches, uh, you know, the the philosophies and all this just washed out noise. Um, And now they have something to rally around. The centrists do in the in the primary field where they can now focus on being anti-Trump and they can slip through the back door and not really talk about policy substance too much and not committing to policy. And, you know, that's what centrists love. They, they love to not commit to anything. They just love this open, uh, leave everything open-ended, uh, never have a position, uh, let's not commit to anything. Um, but this time they're just going to be able to take the Trump rhetoric, the impeachment rhetoric, and run with it and not be too concerned uh, about policy substance. Uh, and, you know, the, it's going to be up to the progressives to call them out when they try to get away from it because – Centrists will benefit from this Trump impeachment on its face, and it's not good for the primary. It, it stands to really screw things up. Any momentum Medicare for all is getting, or whatever policy we want to see supported. So, I think that's a big problem. Like you said, Tom Steyer's in there. He's one of the biggest anti-Trump voices uh, today. He's going to be he's going to be t- towing the anti-Trump flag for the centrist. It's just going to be something we're going to have to work with uh and strategize with and uh can compete with you know because we want these issues spoken on so well i know the latest polling suggests the majority of americans by a slight margin do favor the impeachment inquiry Mm -hmm. and there can be brought more brought out from this inquiry if nancy pelosi and that group are willing to expand the inquiry so that is in favor at least at this point in terms of the general election, I feel that, yes, I agree, Donald Trump's going to get a boost from this in the general election, presuming he can make it to that time. But I also feel the same is going to happen with a lot of people being mobilized because that America really thrives on emotions, uh, you know, like sort of the reactive left, uh, you know, the reactive right. You know, there's still, there's reactive parts of both parties, let's put it that way, and I think just this idea that people will come out in droves, let's get rid of Trump, let's get rid of Trump, is going to be put on a megaphone. The other side is going to be, let's defend Trump, let's defend Trump, because both sides are are, um, going to ramp up this washout in the end. What I'm more concerned about is where it's taking us in two ways. Number one, what you just talked about, uh, where there's less time focusing on progressive topics which definitely doesn't favor progressives, nor the American people. And the second concern is how much will this get ramped up uh, to the point of potentially, you know, riots? How violent will it get? How terrible can it actually get in America? Especially when you have presidents that are calling, or maybe it wasn't Trump, but it was someone significant, I can't remember who it was, calling for civil war. So that yeah. that's, you know, it's getting a little... Um, America's torn apart. You know, think about it. Only three times in history has it ever happened. And only once has there ever been pu- major pushback. With Nixon, there wasn't really a pushback. With Clinton, there really wasn't much of a pushback either. I don't know the first one, what happened. I don't know if you know. But Andrew Jackson. Yeah, Andrew Jackson. I think that was kind of violent, had a violent outcome. So it's, it's a precarious time. For sure. 
But I wanted to get focus in on that debate, the fourth debate, a little more because it brought out another question that was going through my mind. What is the best strategy for progressives to take? Do you think it should just be be a unison agreeing with everybody else that yes, impeachment query should go on, or should there be any pushback from any of the candidates? Like, or, or if they talk about Joe Biden, if they bring up Joe Biden, what is the best uh, kind of answer or um, approach that progressive candidates can take without it being a major negative for them? Well, that's a, that's an interesting uh, question because. Like now it's like the left is really at a point where it's like, okay, we have to coalesce around impeachment. Uh, we have to really try to be one voice. We have to all try to be on one side. We even saw Tulsi Gabbard change her uh, position on impeachment. So it's like 95% of Democrats now, or I think maybe more are for impeachment. So there's gotta be this like feeling if you're on that stage, a feeling that, you know, these are my allies. I need to recognize that these are my allies. But they also have to realize we're here to talk about the issues. So they just can't forget the perspective, you know, that, okay, even though we do have to come together right now at this time in place in history, we really still have to stay focused on the issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that they just have to piecemeal it out like that. But I know there is going to be more unity than you. I would expect more unity on this stage than in previous stages, just because what has transpired with the impeachment. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I, I think you're right to suggest don't waste time on creating dissension, because then it means there's going to be a lot more time squabbling back and forth about whether or not there should be impeachment inquiry. I think it's important to remind the American people this is an inquiry. This isn't an, an actual impeachment. We may find that there isn't enough there to impeach him on, uh, and that's perfectly fine, but we have to do our due diligence per U.S. Constitution to at least carry out this inquiry. And from there, you're right. If they bring up Joe Biden, uh, how much of the time should be focused on that? Like, wh how much would you have, say, Elizabeth Warren or some other Tulsi Gabbard, you know, step up and make that into a major thing? Or would you advise uh -huh. against that? Yeah, I mean, Biden is obviously uh, fodder because he's still leading in the polls. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is still leading the polls, too, or like two or two or three. Uh, like the thing is, Biden should be attacked. He needs to be attacked. But when it comes to the Ukraine thing, which I think that's what you're referring to. Yes. I think that should. Ha OK, I think that should more than likely be left off the table um, for primary attacks, primary debates. I just I see that as just being very taboo right now. Um, if they go after Joe Biden, go after Joe Biden on his record. There's plenty of Joe Biden to attack. Uh, and you don't have to go after his family or Ukraine. You don't have to get down and dirty like Trump does. You can really just go after his record. Hmm. Now, do you think there's a fear that or a possibility if you avoid the corruption topic, Democrats might as a whole come across as duplicitous in some way? Mm, yeah, definitely, because I, I think everyone's well aware now what, what went on in Ukraine with Joe Biden and his son is, is a form of corruption, is a form of, you know, cronyism, whatever you want to call it. It's negative. And, you know, it should be called out to agree. I don't, like, I don't think Joe Biden should get a pass, but I think for the sake of democratic unity, that might happen this time. What do you think? Yeah, I think more than likely the outcome would be what you're suggesting. However, I would love to see someone step up and take Biden down a few notches and bring out this corruption thing because I think it would set mm -hmm. the Democrats, the ones that bring it up, it would set them apart from the rest of the field and demonstrate the stark reality that this is what we're really dealing with. It's not about party allegiance. It's about fighting corruption. It's about fighting cronyism. So you're seeing you're seeing this as like a, a, a position point where the progressives in the field can really expose people like Joe Biden, people in the establishment, for their advantage. I think it would be very tricky. It would be like a minefield. But if it pulled off successfully, yes, I think it would be 
a moment in American history uh, that could come over in favor of progressives in a big, big way, if done correctly. Because okay. it would expose what has needed to be exposed for far too long, that has, a, has had a grip on the American public, which is neoliberalism, uh, neoconservatism, at its finest, and the finest is corruption, and at the worst, yep. you know, God knows, you know, the devil himself. So yes, I think it would be wise if, if the candidates on the stage, one of them, felt they would be able to manage it, and that would have to be Yang, Tulsi, or Bernie, and there's three of them up there. It'd be lovely to see them tag team, or even get Elizabeth Warren in, in there, you know, like, um, right? because she's fairly clean. I mean, she doesn't... I mean, for all of her inconsistency, our lack of trust in whether or not she means what she says and all of that, and if she really is a progressive, at least there's not horrible corruption in her, in her history. I mean, there's some borderline corruption, like, you know, when she, when she uh, said she was American Indian to get into Harvard kind of thing. That's certainly borderline, uh, but not at the level of, a bo uh, you know, Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton, you know. So get her right. in there. So that would be good as well. Yeah, I can see her teaming up with progressives in there, um, just like she did with Bernie. In that in that it was the first or second debate. You know, she she teamed up with Bernie, and it was her and Bernie versus the whole stage. I mean, she can do some good damage for progressives um, if she wants to. So yeah, I would like to see her up there. Um, I would definitely like to see Tulsi do it. Tulsi seems to be like the bravest uh, to go after people personally and. I don't know. She ended. She basically ended Kamala Harris's campaign. I kind of would like to see her go after Biden. Um, I don't think that's gonna because be she's she was kind of nice to Biden, or she's right. been kind of right. mm -hmm. okay. So she's not going to go after him like she went after Kamala Harris. Right. I think hmm. as much as I don't want to say this, and I could be wrong, and I'm hope I hope I'm wrong. I think that. Number one on Tulsi Gabbard's list is obviously, you know, becoming president. But in the back of her mind is, I want to prime myself to become VP. Whether it be Bernie's VP or even Biden's v VP. Now, I like I said, I, I want to <laughs> distance myself from my own comment because I'd like <laughs> to believe that's not true. But if it came out to be true, I wouldn't be 100% surprised because I think that She's really looking at the fact that Biden and Bernie are nearing 80 years old, and she's lining up herself, you see. Um, sure. So she's sense. looking at the long-term picture here. But anyway, the point I was going to make is about Biden is that, like you just stated, she already hinted at, as she did previously in, uh, prior to the second debate, who she may be going after during a Hill interview when they asked whether or not she felt, did Elizabeth Warren have the makings for being a good commander-in-chief? She said, well, I don't see evidence of that, you know. And it's weak, <laughs> it's weak at best, and she hasn't shown me a, a reason why she would be uh, a good commander-in-chief. So, you know, if, it's a, if that's a traitor, you know, a preview, just as she gave us one, you know, prior to the second debate, then it looks like that might be sh someone she might target next. Yeah, I'm all for that. Um, who knows how she'll be after, you know, with, with the impeachment, you know, being out there and how how hunky-dory things are going to be up there. You know, how, uh, you know, are they going to go up there and sing Kumbaya? Or are they going to, you know, do some primary attacks? Uh, like, is to be seen. But since we're talking about Tulsi here, what do you think about uh, Tulsi coming out for something called Medicare Choice? Did you hear about this? I, I did. What is your understanding of, of Medicare Choice before I delve into <laughs> my thoughts on this um, topic here. Um, I, yeah, see, my, my, my insight on it is pretty thin uh, as far as what it is substantively. Um, the, the thing I have it narrowed down to is just a single payer option. Um, it, it, just, just having the word choice in there, you know, it, it, it kind of makes it seem like it's a single payer, but I haven't read any of the fine print on this yet. Okay. Uh, but I've been heard a lot of single payer uh, public option references. I did some looking into it, and the way I understand what she's trying to say, and I personally think she needs to make it more clear. If 
you go to her campaign mm -hmm. page, unfortunately, it just goes to links and stuff like that. She doesn't have a clear-cut, you know, uh, plan written out uh, that you might see on a Bernie or Yang website. Right. But the way I understand it, it's not public option. It's called a private option. The way a public option would work is, okay, so you are given a choice to buy into Medicare for All. Uh, at a certain cost, a certain price, whatever. Uh, but there's not real clarity on how that's being paid for. Whereas, you know, obviously Medicare for All, Bernie has it under RAB's 4% tax, payroll tax. Um, covers everything, and everybody's covered. Now, that's public option. So you can decide to stay with your private insurance or the insurance you currently have, or you can say, you know what, I like Medicare for All better. I'm going to go over here. Now, people like Pete Buttigieg believe that American people will choose to go to Medicare for All, and that's kind of his image of how everything's going to unfold to eventually get us to Medicare for All. And seems to me Yang might have that sort of idea as well, at least from the last I've heard. And he thinks it'll take about six to ten years for Americans eventually to fully go over to Medicare for All. Now, he did talk about a single payer, which is a little bit different, because basically a single payer means there is only one method of payment for all primary treatment, meaning things outside of elective, uh, you know, or cosmetic or things like that. And only the government's paying. They're the single source of payment for hospitals, doctors, etc. Now, with Tulsi, the way I understand it's a little closer to maybe Australia or UK. So what you have is everybody automatically is given... Medicare for all. Everybody gets a payroll tax, uh, 4%. But what you end up doing is when you're getting your treatment uh, from a particular doctor, you can choose to, if that doctor will accept a private, that private insurance, then you can choose to go with that instead of Medicare for all for a certain type of treatment or um, intervention, etc. So it's private insurance that you'll end up getting for that. If you already have the private insurance and you're part of like a union and you like a private insurance, somehow or another, the payment from Medicare for All will come over to your private insurance. I'm not real clear on anything beyond that because, it, like I said, Tulsa doesn't clarify it. My uh, sort of thought is it will end up that people will end up paying a little more maybe if you want the private insurance in some way. Like you might... The 4%, let's, let's presume she goes with Bernie's 4% payroll tax. And then you decide to get some type of treatment maybe on your knee. Then you want to go to a doctor to accept your private insurance. Then in that instance, on some form maybe, I'm just imagining, it'll say, I'm opting for my private insurance. My private insurance will pay the difference. Something like that. And so Medicare for All will pick up on most of the costs and then private insurance will come in and pick up the rest of the cost. That's kind of what I'm thinking, but again, like I said, don't take my word for it because Tulsi has been a bit vague on the details. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it sounds like if, if, if that's true, what you're saying here is like, you're saying that Medicare for all will still be implemented uh, with this Medicare choice option. Is that is that kind of how it is? Right, right, whereas Medicare public option from the beginning, you are you are in um, private insurance, and then you have to opt in to Medicare for All. Whereas under Medicare Choice, it's a private option. You will be covered under Medicare for All, but you can opt to get private insurance for any kind of you know uh, treatment. It doesn't even have to be elective. It can be du duplicative, as far as I can tell. Right. Yeah. But it's which seems to be a problem multi-payer system versus single payer it, right, it's right, sort of right. like it's, it's sort of like there's so many arguments against it uh the multi-payer system because in, it, in order for a single payer system to work you need to eliminate most of the multi-payer private health care systems so right. it's so it's single payer can work right right because of the uh funding the risk pool the funding is being pulled away but as far as i know Everybody's going to get a payroll tax, and so that supports Medicare for All. Right. But if you decide to go with your private option, then 
Medicare for all will only pay for a certain percentage of it or won't pay for it at all. Maybe your private insurance will pay for it. But I'm not sure again. I'm not sure everybody gets taxed and that's how she's able to support her Medicare choice. This is what the real issue is. The, the real issue isn't even whether or not she is supporting Medicare for all versus Medicare with a public option or a private option. The real problem here is she hasn't made it 100% clear. So no one really knows. And this is what's causing some and arguments within the progressive community, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really been, uh, and, and I think Tulsi has benefited from being vague because naturally all the Bernie supporters and a lot of progressives have just naturally attached to Tulsi because what she did in 2016, when she stepped down from the DNC, it's like, oh, whoa, that's Tulsi Gabbard. She stepped down from the DNC. Uh, you know, to support Bernie. She's very bold in her support. So, yeah, so her being vague, a lot of people have kind of just assumed that she's going to go to bat uh, for the Sanders, the Sanders uh, Medicare for all bill. And when they heard that she didn't, there was a huge fallout on Twitter, at least within the Twitter progressives, like they were openly rebuking her and, and really lashing out. Uh, so she's been benefiting from that vagueness you were, you were talking about. But I, I want to give credit to uh, both TYT or whoever else, Michael Brooks, Emily Viglin, Kyle Kalinske, Mike Figueredo, but at the same time also Nico, because I think both of them are right in their, in their own position, because Nico is right. He's saying it's not a public option, so stop calling it a public option. But on the other hand, you know, people like Kyle or Mike are pointing out, you know, this is not really Medicare for all. OK, it's not really a single payer system. So both of them have strong points. Uh, you make a strong point, too, in that, you know, we have sort of taken for granted who Telsey Gabbard is because, you know, her endorsement of Sanders and what she did standing up for him. While at the same time, I don't want to take anything away from her history, because if you look at her policies, uh, what she's done historically, she has been very progressive. You know, her war stance is clearly at the heart of what progressive, you know, progressivism is. We're clearly against imperialism and regime change wars. So that's a major plus, too, that kind of pushes her over the line. Briefly entertaining, who do you think is a, in a better position to potentially be a, a nice matchup for Bernie Sanders? I mean, do you think, do you think it would be more Warren or Tulsi Gabbard? Because Warren seems to mm -hmm. be much more vocal about Medicare for all, even though she's been, you know, duplicitous in her language about it. At least during the debate, she comes out like she's strongly for it. So, so the perception is that she is more on Bernie's side than is Tulsi, unfortunately. Yeah, when when you talk about matchup, you're talking about VP slots here. VP, yes, and and certainly this can go two ways. Uh, you know, Bernie can be. Tulsi's VP or Elizabeth Warren's VP, but let's just for a moment think of it in terms of Bernie gets the nod, and then which of these two uh, do you think better serves uh, his chances of going on to uh, win the general? Mm. Wow, I mean, just just going off of, of of basic stats, it would be Warren just because she has garnered so much support. Uh, she's number two in most polls that I've come across. She's like two or three. Uh, so she already has, you know, a, a big part of the base won over. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Like, I know Tulsi's like at the bottom. She's pulling between zero and two percent. She has a pretty strong grassroots following, but it's nothing like Elizabeth Warren has. Um, but if we go back to 2008, Joe Biden had like no support he had like almost negative support and, and you know obama picked him and it, it's you know the rest is history so i don't know if it matters on stats uh, i think both of these women would be exceptional uh for uh, for a vp slot or even or just on a presidential ticket whether they're president uh and whether someone else is vp um i think they're exceptional uh but I would prefer to see Tulsi because her foreign policy experience is is unmatched. It's unrivaled. Nobody is as strong on foreign policy as Tulsi Gabbard. And to bring that to the table, uh, to match someone like Sanders or Warren or whoever, 
just having Tulsi Gabbard on the ticket uh, would just be so beneficial uh, with someone who has a lot of domestic policy uh, down pat, like like Bernie Sanders, for for instance. But like she's great on domestic policy, too. I'm not taking that away from her. But her foreign policy experience is just bar none. It's unrivaled. I, I would actually pick her over Warren. Uh, but I think Warren would make a great VP as well. Who would you pick? Hmm. Yeah, I agree with your choice. I think Tulsa Gabbard, in the long run, would serve the progressive movement. I feel she's more in alignment with Bernie than is Warren. I think Warren still wants to work within the system, the establishment to some extent. I don't see her foreign mm -hmm. policy going much anywhere. I think Tulsa Gabbard has cross appeal, which will help uh, Bernie in the general election. I do feel in some ways the vibe that you get from Bernie Sanders with Warren almost feels too um, too democratic or too uh, democrat, I guess, is what heavy. Uh, <laughs> even though Bernie is too independent. Left. Right, it feels too left. It feels too swayed. And I would, I would be concerned it might, it definitely would, you know, rile the Democrats but, uh, and maybe some independents, but I'm a little, because of Bernie, but having Warren on the ticket might actually weaken his independent support and even Republican support. But with the Tulsi, definitely I think that would strengthen the independent vote, the Republican vote, as well as the anti-war vote. But she does come with some baggage, unfortunately. You know, the mainstream media has done a lot of damage to her. So that's, that's a concern. But so does Warren. So it's almost a toss-up. Yeah. I think that in the end of all of it, in terms of from a progressive perspective, I think Tulsi is the better pick. Yeah, I do too. I think, yeah, absolutely. I'm with Tulsi over Warren here. Did you see the fundraising numbers for this third quarter? Uh, yeah, I did earlier. Um, Bernie totally had a good third quarter. I think he had $25 million. Uh, and Pete Buttigieg, what do you have, like $21 million? Or No, it was 19 I'm sorry. Um, and Andrew Yang had... 10 million i believe right. and his second quarter was 2.8 million so he's he like tripled his his numbers uh which is unheard of for a third quarter no name candidate <laughs> it's kind of like mm -hmm. what like everyone's trying to figure this one out uh but what do you what do you think about yang hitting a uh, 10 million in the third quarter oh i think it's outstanding and it's very promising uh, i think he is suffering in the polling the same reason sanders is suffering in the polling Tulsi suffering in the polling because of the um, sampling pool uh, generally is older, more centrist, more conservative, more as in conservative Democrat, not independent conservative. So mm -hmm. I think that tends to favor, you know, Biden's and the Elizabeth Warren's. So I think he's better. In other words, I think he's doing a lot better than what the poll polling is suggesting. He's at 3.3 percent average right now in the RCP. But yes, it's definitely very positive for him. Now, Kamala Harris hit a little over 11 million, so he's not that far removed from her. She's anywhere from 5 to 6% right now in the polling. Uh, so he should be up there, I think, in other words. I'm going to ask you, given the way things are right now, where do you see this going over the next three to four months toward the primaries? Like, who do you see being, say, the top five? Wow. Very good question. Let's just go. Let's not Bernie. go even to the. Let's not even go to the primaries. Let's just go to around Christmas time. Kind of see what do you see unfolding. Wow, who's my top five around Christmas time? I mean, Biden, Bernie, and Warren are locked in as far as I'm concerned till the end. And then there's another slot for Andrew Yang, who has shown incremental growth. But growth, and like you said, the growth is underrepresented. Uh, if Kamala Harris is, is having the same amount uh, of, do of dollars donated and she's in five, six, seven percent, you know, Yang should be, you know, solid five, six, seven, eight percent. Uh, so I think Yang is underrepresented, like you said, with the older people, you know, who are polled more often than, say, younger people uh, who are on the internet most of the time. Uh, so Yang is going to be there with the top three. So, and then there's a, probably a, a wild card spot there at number five. Who would be my number five wild card? I don't know. I want to say it's going to be Buttigieg. Um, 
I don't know. I think he's he just has a solid base of support. Um, he's not, and if he is slipping, he's not going away that much. I think like he had twenty one million third quarter. Um, polling is is still low but steady. I think I think Budajid will squeak in there top five. So, but yeah, Budajid, you got Yang, you got Bernie, you got Biden, you got Warren. Hmm. What about your five? Is that pretty close? There's only one caveat, and the caveat is, I think debate four is going to make or break Biden. Uh, okay. I, I, he is slipping. Uh, Warren is taking over, and I think once people begin to see that he's not even able to maintain number one in the polling uh, among Democrats, uh, I think they'll start to lose faith in him, and it could start to fade out. Fade out. And he may decide to pull out even, uh, depending on how much the rhetoric against him, the, the Trump campaign is able to create a narrative around him to uh, just essentially destroy him. Damage goods. Damage, right, right, exactly. I also think Tulsi still has an opportunity to hit the top five. She's been flirting usually in the top ten. So I do think Cory Booker's not going to make it. I don't think but Beto O'Rourke's going to make it. Amy Klobuchar is not going to make it. Steyer is not going to make it. So, yeah. Castro is not going to make it. Castro is not going to make it. So, that really leaves, as you said, um, I'm seeing there's a 50-50 Joe Biden making it. Uh, I think there's 50-50 Tulsi could make it. So, either Joe Biden or Tulsi will be one of the top five. But it can't be both. But I don't think he'll be number one. I think he will be like four or fifth, fourth or fifth, even if he did make it. Uh, number one by Christmas time will either be Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, and uh, presuming Bernie is able to continue his campaign, which I think he will, uh, because of his stent placement right. last last evening, he was in, hospitalized uh, for blockages, but he should be fine. Yes. Presuming he can get out, which I think he will, and he'll be invigorated, and he is willing to go after, and be on fire, and go after and take these people down and contrast yep. himself with others. I think he has a high chance of being number one or number two by Christmas time. If he doesn't do that, then he might be third or fourth or fifth. But then you have, I think Andrew Yang will be in either second or third place by Christmas time. Um, Ooh. If Joe Biden slips, if Joe Biden doesn't slip, then he'll be in the top five, maybe number four or five. And then Pete Buttigieg will round off the top five. If Tulsi's able to get in there, she could be somewhere between number five and number seven. This is obviously going to be a make or break for her, this um, debate. She's got yes. to be able to take down Warren, and I think um, she's got to be able to appeal to women voters. Because um, I think that that's what a lot of women want. They want to get behind a female voter, and that's why you're seeing so much of Kamala's vote going over to Elizabeth Warren. Um, right. If Tulsi can expose... Elizabeth Warren, I don't think they're going to shift over to Amy Klobuchar. No. I think they, they would rather shift over to Tulsi. If Tulsi can speak in a way that appeals to women, then she could potentially start having women shift over to get behind her. I see. She, okay. she does have a yeah. lot of masculine... She, she has a lot of masculine energy, you know, about her. I don't know how to explain that outside of, like, spiritual topics, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> sure. But she does have this sort of dominating presence about her. And some women consider that to be, um, you know, a threat or unbecoming of a woman or whatever. Right. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, do you think I'm just kind of like... <laughs> oh, no, yeah. You, I think, <laughs> no, you hit it when you said, uh, like, how the, that, that she has to come across to the female voter uh, in the most appealing way possible. Uh, because, like you said, Harris, her, her votes you know, went over to Warren. So there was a transfer there. So now if Tulsi comes across um, it, it, in so many ways uh, against Warren, there's going to be a transference potentially uh, from Warren to Tulsi. So you can see that, that that female vote, you know, being shifted around. So you can tell uh, that uh, Warren will be Tulsi's target because she has the most to gain uh, from Elizabeth Warren for that female vote. So I, th I think you kind of laid that out pretty, pretty spot on. 
and we're going to see some fireworks there. We're going to see something between Tulsi and Elizabeth Warren. That's for sure. It's going to happen. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, I definitely hope that's the case because uh, Warren needs to be tried. She's a little weak. In, in She's never really been taken to task, let's put it that way. And she needs to be taken to task, not only because ideally we would want Tulsi over Warren, but even more so because if she does get the nomination, then she needs to know what it's like to be taken to task and be able to stand up against that and be able to make it through. Okay, yeah, like like a vetting, like a just you know putting her right. through the ropes. Right, exactly. And and can she survive? Can she make it? Is she gonna make boot camp or not? You know. <laughs> right, right. And Definitely. who else to get her go through boot camp than Tulsi? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, definitely. Let's see if there's any other topics. Let's see. Uh, so it looks like, Dave, your uh, channel's been going quite a bit there. I think you're over 1,600 now. That's quite rapid growth just in the past, what has it been, three or four months? You've jumped up six or 700. So yeah, I think so. I think I got it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I did my first video at the end of November. Uh, of last year, so with ne November next month, you know, 1600 in, in a year. I don't know. I know like growth on YouTube is exponential, like those numbers double, they triple as you go. But I'm, you know, I, I've, I, I'm very happy with my channel and where it's going. And uh, I got a pretty dedicated uh, fan base going, and, you know, I, I plan on building on it. Uh, so thanks for mentioning that. But you, my friend, 20,000 subscribers. Congratulations to you. Oh, well, thank you very uh, much. You have, I, when, I, when I first met you, uh, uh, well, online, of course, uh, you had, I think you had 5,200. Mm. Uh, so, you, I mean, like, you've, like, quadrupled your numbers within a year. Uh, you're, I just see, you know, your view count is off the charts. Uh, you're doing some pretty good work, though, too. You, you deserve everything that you get coming your way. Thank you very much. And you, if you haven't done so already, go to Dave's channel. It's Progressive Resistance Media. That's PRM. He is putting out awesome content, and he has a unique brand of his own. So go there to check it out. You, you're going to love it. And also note that he is all about the Progressive Coalition, just as I am. So he's right behind those top four that we always talk about on our channel. So... You definitely want to sign on. Absolutely. Tulsi, Bernie, Yang, Marianne, Coalition, baby. That's right. Any other topics, Dave, before we sign out today? Yeah, I don't think so. I think we covered everything. All right, super. All right, so um, hopefully we'll get to do Progressive Talk podcast number 20 next time around, just before this upcoming 15th, 4th debate. What do you think? Yeah, let's, let's, we'll definitely do one pre-debate, and then we'll do one post. Okay, awesome. All right, then. So I guess we're signing out for now. This is Progressive Podcast number 19. Can you believe that? I know. It's awesome. So I put it on my pay playlist on my channel. I don't know if you're going to be doing the same, Dave. So if you guys haven't checked out the other 18, please do so. Yeah, I've already made a list. I made a playlist of uh, Progressive Talk podcasts on my channel, so feel free to check them out. Super. And one last thing I was going to point out for future podcasts, if you guys have any topics that you'd like Dave and I to discuss, go ahead and leave them in the, the comment section below. Absolutely. Okay, Dave. Take care and have a good week, and we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks, Josh. Take care. Bye.